Okay, welcome everyone. Um, do you hear me at the back? It's all good? All right, fine. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about awesome tools to level up your Spring Cloud architecture. Um, first things first, who am I? Uh, I'm Andreas Evers. I work for Ordina Belgium, uh, which is a consultancy firm in Belgium. And uh, I'm really enthusiastic about open source, um, about um, contributing, uh, about REST, clean code, microservices, all that cool stuff, right? Um, but today I'm going to talk about Spring Cloud, but not traditional Spring Cloud, right? Because there's been quite a lot of talks already about it. First of all, bootiful microservice from Josh Long. Um, that was just about Spring Boot, and then what Spring Cloud could do in terms of Netflix OSS. Um, that turned into cl a cloud native Java. Um, we also saw Kenny Bastani uh, talk about cloud native uh, Java microservices. And there were some, a bunch of other talks as well about cloud native, um, about microservices, ecosystem around it with Netflix. Um, and a bunch of these tools have been discussed at this conference as well. Um, you see all of them here. Uh, there are some more, um, but those ones are, um, I've seen them a lot already, so I won't focus on those. Um, I will, however, talk a bit on these tools. Um, so from Spring Cloud itself, we got Contract and REST Docs. I'm gonna touch on that really quickly because it's, it's a very nice combination, I think. Um, and some other tools which aren't necessarily from Spring, but which work really well with Spring. So you've got Spring Boot Admin, which is a really nice UI I'll mention. Uh, Microsoft's dashboard for visualizing microservices and how they interact with each other. Wiremock and Saboteur for uh, testing uh, purposes. Spinnaker for deployments. Troublemaker for causing chaos uh, in your Spring Boot microservices. Then some Sonar, OWASP, uh, other quality tests. Um, Prometheus for monitoring and ALK for logging, of course. So let me ask a very important question first. Who watches Archer? <laughs> awesome. Okay, I love Archer, so I put instead of topic slides, I put some screenshots on, for Archer in here um, to, I mean, make it a bit more funny, I suppose. Um, so this one is about monitoring, right? Like, how do we monitor our, our services? How do we know what's up with these services? Because now we've got all of a sudden a lot more Spring Boot services, not just one application. It's harder to manage, it's hard to keep them alive. So first tool, Spring Boot Admin. Who's familiar with Spring Boot Admin? Okay, great, so almost everyone. So I put some screenshots up here um, to illustrate what it could do for those who don't know yet. Um, so you basically see an overview of all your services. Uh, you can go into the details of them. Um, and there you can see the, the regular actuator endpoints in a nice graphical way, which is nicer than just JSON, right? Um, so you can see uh, info endpoints, um, health endpoints, all the statistics. Uh, that your microservice or your Spring Boot application is exposing. Metrics, of course, um, that are standard coming out of the, the, the actuator endpoints. Environments information, log information as well, which is pretty nice. You don't actually have to SSH into the server anymore to see the log files. You can show them in UI as well. You can tail them. It's not, just, it's not really like ELK, um, but it gives you an impression of what's going on with this, with this specific instance. Um, so the environment variables. An interesting thing here as well is you can do something special with actuator, which some people might not know about yet. You can actually overwrite the properties by setting them, but of course, just for the life cycle of that instance. If the instance restarts, it's gone. If the application's uh, context restarts, it might be gone as well. So uh, that's, it's a nice way to uh, refresh your environment. Uh, also, if you work with a config server, it's, um, it's a really easy way to, to update your service with the new configuration, which is uh, present in the config server. So that's a, a nice plus. If you have uh, Jolakia or uh, GMX um, enabled, you can check log levels and you can change them really quickly, which is very powerful, I believe. Um, of course, the managed beans themselves as well. Uh, you can really screw around in them, so watch out. <laughs> uh, and then thread uh, the threads that are currently running, um, and you can have a trace uh, of all, all the requests that came into your system. So pretty, pretty useful. And the latest version also now has integration with the history dashboard. So before you had to set up the history dashboard um, separately and then uh, check your circuit breakers from there, but now you can see them inside Spring Boot Admin as well. Although I have to say, watch out with this because Spring, um, the circuit breaker, uh, it has a stream and you can only have five consumers at a time. Okay, otherwise it might actually impact the service. 
So if, if everyone's opening this, um, that might actually clog it up. So you have to watch out. So uh, aside from that, you have a journal of everything that happens. So that's pretty cool stuff, just to see information about your specific instances. Now, what if we want to go deeper? If we want to see further into these instances and what's going on? You can have a tool called Prometheus. And who's familiar with Prometheus? OK, that's not even half. So that's great, S something new then, I suppose, for most people. Uh, Prometheus is a multidimensional um, data series, time series um, tool or platform that allows you to visualize uh, metrics um, in Grafana. Right? And you can also do alerting on it. So the idea is it's, it's kind of from SoundCloud. Um, you all know SoundCloud, right? Um, so they were working on it for two years until in 2015, where they blogged about it. And then it really spiked. So it's getting really popular. Um, and it's a great tool to see what's going on currently at this time. It's maybe not the best tool to have years of data visualized. You could do it, but to our experience, it's maybe not the perfect tool for that. For that. Um, but the architecture, how that works, is you have your Prometheus server. It can get information from your ecosystem uh, with a push, push gateway. Uh, if your services aren't, um, if you can't just query it from the service itself, um, you can get information about um, what services are out there with service discovery. So console, Kubernetes, DNS, all that stuff. Um, and then uh, you have alerts integrated. Um, so based on the metrics, if you put some thresholds or whatever, you can have alerts, pager duty, email, you know, the typical, the usual suspects. Um, and then you can have UIs with PromQL, which is the query language for Prometheus. Um, if you want to know more about uh, how it works and how you can set it up, we wrote a blog post about this. Um, and it's pretty uh, useful, I think, uh, for newcomers. Uh, so you can definitely check it out. It's, I will post the slides online as well, so you don't have to take a picture or something. Um, but um, the idea here is that um, it's, uh, it's giving you also a complete demo environment that you can set up yourself. Um, so aside from the architecture that it talks about, similar story that I talked about, um, and it gives some examples of how to run it. Um, and it's really easy to integrate it in Spring Boot as well. So eventually, you'll, you'll see that you have, in this example, cats versus dogs. Oh, you can't see it. Whoops. Uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we go. Um, so in this example, cats versus dogs, uh, that's, that's the use case where it, where it actually goes through. So if you want to get familiar with, with um, Prometheus and Grafana, it's a great way to start. Okay, so um, there's also some um, pitching from, uh, from the actual um, uh, creator, uh, Julius Foltz, who, um, who also put some comments in there. So it's, it's a pretty good place to start, right? Um, okay, so that's Prometheus. Um, oh yeah, an interesting thing to mention as well is that um, we all kind of know about Hystrix, I suppose, um, as it's a very important part of, of Spring Cloud or the Netflix stack. Um, but um, oftentimes, we just forget to, um, to set the timeouts correctly, to set the bulkheads uh, correctly. Um, and, uh, and this is an illustration from Hystrix itself, uh, where it shows you how you should set it. Um, but you really should do it um, based on metrics. So you do, should do some load tests and stress tests. And then based on those metrics, you should figure out the settings for your circuit breaker. And that's often different than what the defaults are. Okay, and one way to, to figure that out is to integrate this with uh, Prometheus. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, okay, let me show you an example. So if you just enable Prometheus metrics for your Spring Boot uh, microservice, um, you get the same metrics as you would in the slash metrics endpoint of actuator. And there is automatically with servo, if you at least don't turn servo off, you get um, a bunch of commands information already, um, such as, for instance, the, um, the latency of a certain percentile of your traffic. Um, I might actually find an example here. Yeah. So here you can see that um, all of your calls, the latency for all of your calls is 233 milliseconds. Okay. But um, if you look at the 99th percentile, you can see it's, uh, in this case, it's similar, but it could be vastly different. And that can help you to figure out where you should cut off. 
okay? Because sometimes um, if you see the load of, um, of your application or of an, un an endpoint, um, then it might be that in the, the final percentiles, so the worst cases, so the worst 1%, for instance, you see a huge spike in latency, the time it takes to respond. So it would be good to say if, your, um, if the time expires uh, or goes above a certain um, threshold, that you just retry. And that that's built into a hysterics as well. So this can then be visualized in Grafana as well, um, or any, any Prometheus metrics, basically. Um, here you have uh, uh, another service example, um, where you got a bunch of, of metrics that are automatically fetched. This is the, uh, the, the counters, for instance, like the star star, that kind of stuff. You, you'll see that coming back in, um, in your metrics endpoint as well. You can also enable this for your tooling. For instance, if you have Jenkins running, you can also, um, let me make it a little bit smaller. Um, you can also have Jenkins metrics exported in Prometheus, and that can also be visualized in uh, Grafana dashboards. So then you can actually, in this case, this is a, an integration microservice with a database, which does some synchronization, and we, we monitor this. And that's based on these Prometheus metrics that we have exposed from our application. Okay, you, you can also see um, um, interesting information about the platform that you're running on. Um, you could do that with, um, with Cloud Foundry, or in this case, I'm running it on, um, on GCP. So, uh, hold on. I actually have an example here. So, <laughs> so you, can s you can see all kind of interesting metrics um, about your CPU or your network or I.O. or whatever. Right? Um, so that's a great tool um, to visualize what's going on with your system. And alerts that you put on this can help to also um, keep it up and running, right? Um, okay, so let me continue. Right, there's also some other tools, um, like, yeah, of course, Graphite, um, but also InfluxDB, OpenTSDB, or some commercial tools like New Relic, AppDynamics, or Dynatrace. And Prometheus has a, uh, a comparison, so that's pretty biased, I suppose, but it gives you an indication of what's the, what the differences are. Um, so definitely have a look, but at least you should have something, some way of figuring out what your system is, is doing. And Prometheus has great integration with Spring Boot, um, so that's, that's a really useful kind of this. The next one is uh, ELK. ELK, everybody knows ELK, right? So <laughs> I won't talk about it too much. Um, but it's important to have log aggregation as well. Um, and then here you have some examples as well of, of alternatives. Splunk, I really like, but it's very, very expensive. So if you have a lot of money, by all means, use it. But uh, otherwise, um, ELK should be, should be fine as well, because it's, it's open source and it's free. So on to the next topic. OK, this is about developers who think they have all the power in the world to do whatever they want in their microservice. Because that's kind of what microservices promise a little bit, right? Um, so that's, that's a, a great advantage because you can, you can use new technologies, right? You can use the right tool for the right job. Um, but it, it has to be contained in a regular enterprise because you don't want to be stuck with this recruitment, these recruitment problems or not knowledge transfer problems, uh, especially if you can't just hire the best people in the world. So um, there's a great talk uh, at uh, JFocus uh, from Patrick Malen. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's actually at Spotify, and they built a system called System Z. And that is um, a system which shows you uh, which microservices are out there, which teams are out there, which teams own which microservices, um, what the responsibilities are, uh, what the dependencies are between these microservices, and, uh, and how the system is currently alive or or not, right? So that's, that's a nice way to visualize um, to everyone in the company how microservices are structured, how they're managed, how they're operated. Okay? And that's important to have because otherwise it's hard to know um, if you have a problem with a microservice or if your microservice is impacted by other microservices, what to do about it. Okay? So um, there is a couple of, of people in the organization, um, types of people that, um, that also are involved or uh, impacted by choosing microservices. And the first one is, of course, a manager. Right? The manager, they, they want to get a sense of, of what's the compliance and the maturity of the services that are out there. Okay? They also uh, want to have that recruitment and that knowledge uh, transfer or knowledge sh sharing accommodated in a nice way as well without 
having gaps to fill and nobody in the market to fill them. The technical depth, they also want to know. So they, of course, they can then know who to chase um, because otherwise it's, it's going to be a very brittle system if, if people just don't care about quality. So that's an important one to also think about. Um, and to me, a very important one is to have budget and priorities in line with the architectural goals. Because that's something with microservices, in my experience at least, is that often gets, people get it wrong. Because um, if you have a proof of concept with microservices, you use Spring, you use Spring Cloud and Spring Boot, it's going to work. It's going to be fine, right? But then you start scaling up and you see that things aren't really um, that, that mature. So you, you have to keep investing in it. And making sure that managers are aware of that is key to it. Because otherwise, they're just going to suppose that everything's working and your system is going to explode. Okay, so that's, to me, the most important one. And then change management is important as well. Before we had ticketing systems and change managers were happy with this because they could have this, um, these release cycles where they had control over everything. Now everything goes to production every time, uh, all, all the time actually, every day. So that's difficult. So we need to make sure that we have systems or at least visibility for, for the managers to keep them happy as well. We can't just think about development. And the next type of people are analysts. They also want to see functionality in the system because now we got microservices, they're com contained to a bounded context. Now, which functionality can I reuse? Which microservices can I reuse in which context? Which resources are exposed by what services, of course? So APIs, documentation, that kind of stuff. Events and messages that are being sent back and forth, um, an important one as well. And um, if I make a change, which service will be impacted? So that's something we need to know, right? We can do something like um, Spring Cloud Contract, which I'll talk about later, to visualize this as well. And then how does a functional flow travel all the way through your system? Because if you have a monolith, it goes inside the monolith and into the database and back. It's pretty simple. Now we have all these, these microservices, we've got to think about distributed tracing, like right? Zipkin, something like that, right? Um, and what's coming up? And if, if something's coming up, how can I define that it's coming up? So that other teams actually know that it's coming up and they won't build the same thing. Okay, so that's important to, to visualize as well for analysts. And then we've got the developers, right? The developers, they kind of want to know about their own system, right? They want to know which versions are deployed where, what's the state of them, are they successfully deployed, um, dependencies of them, like which versions are currently deployed, and uh, I want to know everything about my service, like a communication hub. That's something I want to have. Okay, so all these people, they, they want their, their own they have their own requirements, and we have to be able to fulfill them. Otherwise, they're going to be very unhappy, and they're not going to sponsor your microservice effort. So we saw that there's nothing like, like System Z currently available. There's nothing open sourced um, that we can use. So we kind of had a, to build it ourselves. We built a, a dashboard for microservices. I'm not saying this is the holy grail of dashboards, but it should give you an indication of what could be a good way for visualizing all this, these requirements. Okay, so it looks a bit like this. The resolution is pretty bad, but it has the, f the four layers of your architecture, which are probably still there. So UI components, resources, or events, microservices that emit them or uh, consume them, and backends like databases um, or queues or uh, legacy systems that you still have to integrate with. Um, so this is something we we pull out of the ecosystem with some kind of uh, aggregators that we use. So if you have a source of information, like for instance, PACT, the PACT broker for consumer-driven contract tests or Spring Cloud contract, then we can get this information and we can know how these services are communicating with each other. And that we can easily put in here. It's so just the same thing with health indicators. If you have health indicators um, in your service which have maybe dependent health indicators of other services, you can also use this to visualize it. Okay, so all this information, we can just scrape this and visualize it together. Then of course, you have to be able to, um, to filter through it. So if you look here in my example for pizza, you'll get only the pizza specific resources. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can also get information about which services aren't really compliant. You don't want to limit the services too much, but some things like uh, here, for instance, um, yeah, we, we want an index because we were, we were using hypermedia. 
We want every service to emit an index so that we know which, which resources are available on that, um, on that instance. Um, that's something which we require. Or if there's, for instance, a quality gate that has to be there, if you didn't implement it, it's just being lazy, I suppose. So um, uh, that's something which we can also put as a rule, and then we can query it if it's actually been um, applied or not. And that's something that managers want to know. Right? Um, then we can also add uh, virtual nodes uh, to, to indicate that something's coming up. And once it's available in the system, in the ecosystem, it will replace the virtual node with the real one. So that's straightforward. So if you wanted to give, give it a try, there's a reference documentation out there. Um, and I suppose uh, if you just look for Microservices dashboard on Google, you'll find it as the first link. OK, so that's the way of visualizing it. OK, now the next topic is about <laughs> um, if you deploy your microservices into the cloud, you're actually deploying on someone else's PC, someone else's computer, and that computer could go, go down at any moment. It could have problems. It could manifest um, issues. Um, so it's a bit like the systems are working against you. So you have to test everything really well. Okay? Um, and the there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, first, the first of all is virtualization. Um, so Tom Akehurst has built Wiremock, which is familiar to everyone, right? Who knows Wiremock? Okay, great, a lot of people. Who knows Saboteur? <laughs> Two people, <laughs> maybe three. So it's also from him, uh, but nobody uses it. Yet it's pretty cool. It's, it's, nice, um, it's a nice tool also to use, and I'll illustrate why. Um, so uh, why do we use Wiremock? We use it to test our service against a virtualized version of a dependency. Right? Um, so instead of that dependency over there, we're going to create a virtualized dependency, and we're going to use Wiremock for that. Okay? So now we're going to uh, query this Wiremock service instead. Okay? Um, so what can we do with this? We can check if we can, we can put a delay in there and test that. What's the, um, uh, if the timeout would be hit, for instance, based on the delay. Um, we can also inject failure. And the failure could be um, a 500 error or some other error. Random data. We could just inject random data and see what, how the Spring Boot microservice is dealing with that. We can have malformed data as well. That could happen as well. And we can have an empty response. There's some, some scenarios that you might want to test to see how your service is reacting to that. But now, um, there are other, other things as well that could mess with your service. Um, for instance, firewalls. Okay, what do we do with that? Um, we saw that if we have uh, these tests, we're pretty resilient, but there are still some cases that our timeouts, for instance, didn't get hit. And that's, that's the idea of service uh, level agreement tests, SLA tests. Right? If we would need to respect an SLA of, for instance, three seconds, we need to reply in three seconds, then it's important for us to make sure that our dependencies also that reply to us in less than three seconds. Otherwise, it's impossible to reach that SLA, right? So how do we do that? We put timeouts on that connection. But if you put a, time on it, a timeout on it, it's often on one level of the OZ model. And uh, for instance, on the, uh, the transaction, the transport of the data. And, but if the socket isn't even able to open or to connect, then the timeout will never get reached, right? It will never get triggered. So that's why uh, Saboteur gets into the picture. Saboteur kind of burns down this, the, the different layers of the OSI model. So we can also put delay there, but we can inject other failures as well. So here we can have network partition. Okay, that's a useful error as well to, 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 to virtualize or to simulate. Um, we can have remote service not listening to port, uh, packet loss, and we can simulate firewall uh, problems with TCP connection timeouts. So those exceptions, um, if, we in, if we started using them, we saw that um, our service wasn't actually working as expected when those things hit. Okay, so that indicates that our service is vulnerable for cloud issues. Okay, so um, Wiremock was fine, but even though with those exceptions, we still had issues, apparently. So having Saboteur um, is a useful tool to also make sure that you have those um, network issues under control. Okay? So if you want to know more about this, Christopher Beatty has a great talk about this um, on DevOps, but he has spoken at other events as well, um, about SLA testing and, um, and making sure that your timeouts 
are set correctly on all the different levels. Okay, and this can help you make sure that this is respected and this keeps the same way by writing tests about it. Okay, so making sure that your network is under control and your SLAs are fine, it's one part of the, of the, of the story. The second part is break everything. <laughs> don't, break, don't just break the network, but break more. And Simeon Army from Netflix is doing that. Now, um, I'm not sure if Simeon Army would work if you're not running on Amazon. I've seen it as part of the uh, OpenShift stack, but I, or the, no, not OpenShift, uh, Fabric 8 stack, but I don't know if it actually works there. Um, I think it's useful to have something which is more easily integrated with Spring Boot, right? And that's already there. There's a new project, it's pretty fresh, um, but it actually works, and I'll demo it. Uh, Troublemaker, it's called, and it integrates really well with Spring Boot, and it helps you to um, cause chaos in your microservice architecture with Spring, okay? Um, so if all goes well, well, I probably should be able to demo this. Okay, so I'm, I'm running on Kubernetes here, um, and um, there's a UI. Where is it? Here it is. Okay, so a couple of uh, hours ago, I already tested it out just to make sure. I restarted the service so you can't see a big log. But the things you can do here is you can manually cause chaos to your services. I got a bunch of services running here, and I can kill them, I can increase load on them, or I can have an exception and see how that exception is handled in the logs or if alerts are triggered by, get, by those exceptions, and I can increase the memory. These things can, I can do myself manually, but I can also uh, set it up so that it, it actually does that automatically. And here at 4 p.m., I don't know if you can see it at the back, um, maybe I can scroll down. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's the furthest I can go. <laughs> uh, it actually selected a random instance in this case, it read a Sentinel, and it targeted it, and it tried to kill it. In this case, it didn't work, because you need to add a dependency, just a Spring Boot dependency, uh, like an auto configuration, on the service that you want to allow to be killed. Okay. So in this case, um, MS Rental in this in this case has this, so I can kill this one, and I'll show you that it actually works. Otherwise, it's a bit lame, I suppose. Um, so. Let's see, okay. So I have, have anyone familiar with Kubernetes? Okay, not, okay, so there's, these are my applications running, and uh, here you can see how many times they're restarted, okay? So Kubernetes has the advantage that it will restart my services if they are killed. Okay, so this, this helps me to, to, um, to make sure that my tests are uh, asserted correctly, okay? So um, I wanna kill it, but I wanna make sure that my chaos is contained. That, uh, that actually starts up again. So in this case, MS Rental is running here. It has two restarts, okay? So I will monitor it. And normally we should be seeing now at the bottom that it has restarted, okay? So I just kill it now, okay? Here it says it killed it. And you can see it has an error. And right after, it started running again. So this verifies that my chaos is contained. That I'm not, uh, if, if there would be a, a problem with my service and it would be killed somehow, that I can actually manage it and that my system is self-healing. Okay, so this is just one, one case. Um, I can demonstrate the others as well, but the idea is that it allows you to test these things which, which you would normally um, hope that never happen. Okay, so that allows you to be prepared for it. Okay, so that's the idea of Chaos Monkeys as well. Um, but this is just super easy. Add a dependency, add an annotation, and you're ready to go. Okay? And the server that's visualizing this dashboard is also a matter of just adding an, annota uh, an annotation and a dependency, and it starts up. Okay? So just check it out if you're interested in this. Um, it's Troublemaker. Okay, so um, now we've got, um, we've got Chaos. We've got visibility in our system. Okay, we've got um, monitoring. We need to, s and we have virtualization, and we have a couple of tests. But the most important thing about microservice is, well, uh, one of the important things uh, is that um, it is no longer easy to, to do an end-to-end -end test. And you have to have some kind of way to ensure there's a safety net between your services. 
Uh, it's, it's hard to spin up an entire environment for your one little change. Right? It's like an entire feature environment. That's difficult because, I mean, all these different services are now independently deployed. Okay, so uh, we have to find a way to ensure that the safety net is there. Okay, so this brings me to my next topic, and that's about Spring Cloud Contract. Okay, so who has uh, worked with Spring Cloud Contract? Okay, and who has heard about it? A little bit more. Okay, so um, the idea there um, is that you have a consumer and a producer of a contract, right? So there's an API producer, and the consumer just uses that API. Now, if the producer returns 10 properties, then this consumer could use only first two properties, okay? Now, let's say there are four consumers. If they all use only the first five properties, then, I mean, that, that gives us flexibility for the producer to change the next, the last five, okay? So that's something which a producer would like to know. Now, the, uh, the consumers, like the first one, what they can do is they can use Spring Cloud Contract to document what they are using from the contract, and the producer can then use that information to assert whether that's still accurate. Okay, so what does the, the consumer do? It goes towards the producer, it writes the contract, uh, it's saying, okay, I'm using property one and two, write a test around that, then the, the producer can actually put that in a jar as, as part of a contract test, then the, cons the consumer has integration tests for this. And with Wiremock, which is pretty cool about Spring Cloud Contract, is using those, um, those contracts as a mock, so you already have that virtualization out of the box. So this works pretty well together, right? Um, and then if that works well on the consumer, the consumer is certain that his, his part of the contract, that his interaction will always be the same. Now, of course, on the producer side, you want to run these tests every time there's a build. Okay, so you issue a PR, the producer can then take that, requ that request, can take that contract test, and put it in his, in his own pipeline. So next time he makes a code change, he will run his, the test against his service to see if those two properties are still there. Okay, so that's a huge advantage. And you can do that for all your contracts, all your different consumers. Okay, so now the, the, the benefit here is that your producer, he knows which services are actually calling him and how they're calling him. So he knows that the five last properties in this case were not used. So he doesn't have to version. And this added complexity is not necessary because nobody's using the last five properties. Because that's, that's a huge benefit for making sure that your, your system stays healthy. And your consumers are happy now because they're certain that the producer is never going to be changing the contract without them being notified. They can't even change it because the builds will break. Now the producer is also now aware which services he has to talk to if he wants to make a breaking change or if he wants to make sure that those services are upgrading to a new version. Okay, so this gives you the safety net between the services that we were missing. Okay? And then the last part here is that you also have some quality tests, of course, like shifts that those tests left, also, also like a security tests you can also put in here so you can also have that integrate in your pipeline. So this is all pretty familiar, I suppose. Um, so that was about testing. Now, about APIs, right? You have to make sure they're child's play. <laughs> you have to make sure that you're offering a service to your customers, to your clients, and you have to make it as easy to use as possible. Okay, so even the child should be able to, to use your API. That's the idea. Well. <laughs> Spring REST docs can do that. Um, so you can do document, of course, your services. Who's, who's worked with Spring REST docs before? All right, yeah, so a lot more people who can be converted to Spring REST docs. Awesome. Uh, so how does that work? So um, you have integration tests. We all have integration tests, right? Uh, using Wiremock uh, in our case. Um, and what they do is they use mock MVC oftentimes and they will make calls to your service, um, and they will get responses back. Straightforward. Now, those requests and responses, they are actual HTTP requests and responses to your actual service. Okay, so this gives you a great, uh, gives you great information 
to put in your documentation because those requests and responses are accurate at all times, okay? Because they're actually run against your real service. So if you can document these, if you can distill them and generate snippets, you can use these snippets in your documentation. Now we combine this with a manually written template. Why manual? Why not have everything documented? Because some parts of your API you still want to have um, human written information about. You don't want to do that for request and response fields or headers, that kind of stuff, because that changes a lot. But the idea of your service, what the, con the concepts mean, those things you still want to document manually. Okay? So that's a great combination of having human written documentation and making sure it's always up to date with these generated snippets. You combine it together in ASCII doc and you get a generated HTML or PDF or whatever. Okay? So um, this gives you documentation out of the box and you, just can, you can actually use your integration tests and have a hook on that for, um, for mock MVC that's pretty straightforward and um, have automatic documentation. Okay, so this is one part of the puzzle. Second part is um, a little bit more into the code. Like let's say you have a Pojo a car and it has a brand and it has doors. Okay, we have a car controller which uses this Pojo um, and it's exposing car, right? In this, ca in this case, a BMW. Um, so um, what you can do is you can have a marker interface, compact view. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with JSON views, but this is the idea behind this. You have a marker interface where you say, in case I'm asking for a compact version of this Pojo, of this car uh, representation, I only want to see brand. I don't want to see doors. I don't, I don't care about doors, okay? Um, now, I can enable that representation by adding this annotation JSON view on top of the controller method. This will allow you to make sure that your car is only returning brands and not doors. It's pretty, pretty easy to do, right? And it also allows you to go one step further and use this for versioning. Because if we use versioning, we often start to duplicate Bojos or duplicate services uh, that we have separate branches next to each other or whatever. This allows you to start versioning inside the same POJO, just with metadata on top of your properties. Like one property is only for version one, the second one is only for version two, right? It's pretty, pretty straightforward, it's readable, and it's, it's manageable, right? You can keep track of it. And in the, in the controller, it's also pretty straightforward here as well. You have your V1 um, controller method, which will, of course, have the representation of V1. It produces the media type for V1, and the second one, of course, for V2, okay? So having this combined with your REST docs and with your um, contract tests, you can have a very easy way to make sure you have a full solution for documentation, testing, and maintainability. Okay? And this doesn't really add too much burden on top of your production code. This isn't like Swagger where, where it's Spring REST docs, you have an integration test. With Swagger, you'd have extra methods here are extra annotations just to, to indicate what your documentation should generate. Okay, so this keeps your pr production code lean and mean. Okay, so uh, these three tools combined give you a great, a great idea of, of how an API um, could be constructed. Um, at least in my opinion, this is a great way. Okay, and then, um, so once we've built the service, we built the API, um, we can go one step further, we can deploy it. And what, what I often see is that um, people start to use Ansible to deploy to the cloud or to deploy to VMs. And those scripts become to, they're, they're small scripts, but they're often very complex and, and they're not tested well. Uh, and they start to have their own life, right? <laughs> they're very hard to, to maintain. People have to document them because, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a really a mess. And I would like to have uh, for deployment the same as for my continuous integration. Continuous integration, I have build pipelines in Jenkins, for instance, or in Concourse. Right? That's with a UI, I can see what's happening, okay? I wanna have that as well for my deployments. I can do that as well in Jenkins, but I have to write these, these Ansible scripts there. Um, you don't have to do that because there's a tool for that called Spinnaker. Okay, Spinnaker is a multi-region, multi-cloud deployment tool from Netflix. It's built on uh, Spring Technologies, by the way. 
Uh, they first started out with Asgard, it's a, pre a, a predecessor of Osteniker, but now they moved and they completely started from scratch. It's a little bit like a, a microservice uh, architecture under the hood. Um, and it allows you to deploy your service over multiple clouds, multiple regions, um, with specific strategies that you don't have to write yourself in, in Ansible. Um, so it allows you to have a view as well on your environment, which instances are alive, which instances are dead um, or having issues. Um, and, but the, the most important part here, I think, is the deployment pipelines. And you can see here as well, you can have canary deployments where you can have certain assertions on whether the canary was successful or not and then have certain rollbacks or rollouts of your uh, instances. And all this is, is really easy to set up because it's for the UI, people can understand it, and even people who are, who are not familiar with cloud can now all of a sudden set up something that they're familiar with from Jenkins. Okay, so this is for me an, a very strong, strong tool. Um, one thing it doesn't have yet is configuration as code. So where you have in, um, in Jenkins the, the, the pipelines, the Jenkins pipelines, this is not there yet, so you can't, I mean, you can um, have JSON ex um, uh, ex exported from these pipelines that you set up, but there's no way to put it in, in Git yet, something like Jenkins. Okay, but they're working on that, apparently. I don't know when they're actually going to release it. Um, and if you want to want to know more about this, there is a YouTube video um, explaining uh, all the different options about Netflix uh, Spinnaker uh, from the uh, Amazon reInvent uh, from 2016. Um, so that's a great suggestion to watch. Um, I, I can actually give you a demo of what we are um, what we're using here. Um, so Spinnaker, there we go. Oh, shoot. <laughs> okay, so uh, pop, 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 yeah, Spinnaker. I have to make it a bit smaller. Is it readable at the back? Great, okay, so um, you can create um, project dashboards uh, where you can see the deployments that, can, that happen inside your team. So in this team, we have a bunch of Spring Cloud services like um, uh, Config Server, Gateway, um, the troublemaker is there, the, MS dash the Microsoft dashboard is there, the admin server is there. Uh, so that, that toolbox, all these different de deployments here, they are visualized, whether they're successful or not. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, of course, also the health of my cluster on dev and on production. Okay, so for all the different services, you can see if there's something, something not working or whatever. Um, you can also alert, uh, alert on this, of course. Um, so if you go inside one of them, uh, for instance, the gateway, what you can do here is um, you can set up your pipeline. Um, let me configure it so it's clear which different configurations are in there. So uh, this one is, has this Docker trigger from a Docker registry. Um, if there's a new, um, a new image or a, yeah, a new image available in the Docker registry, it will trigger this pipeline and then it will deploy this to a dev environment, uh, in this case. Uh, it's, um, it's using the Highlander strategy. Highlander strategy is the idea of there can only be one, and it will cut off the heads of all the existing ones. <laughs> it's a bit br brutal, um, but <laughs> it's one of the strategies that you can use. Um, you can also yeah, have red-black. This is the Netflix version of blue-green. <laughs> okay, but the idea is like um, for dev, in our case, we use Highlander because we don't care about previous instances because it's just a development environment. But for production, you might want to do uh, blue-green here and because you easily want to roll back to the previous version and if it's still there, it's easy to do, right? And it does offer you even a roll back button to click on. Uh, I can show it as well. Um, and you can also have custom deployment strategies that you can then reuse over multiple projects. Okay, so that's powerful because otherwise you'd have to script this information. Like also Canary, uh, I don't know if there's one specific already there, no. But um, you could have your specific Canary deployment script in there. Okay. And you only have to write it once, you can use it for all your different services. Okay, so um, that's a bit the idea here. Um, then you can have manual judgments as well, because 
like in banking sector, I don't suppose you want to have continuous deployments. Uh, well, maybe you could if you're living on the edge, but um, I would probably want <laughs> as a manager to be able to push on a red button to go to production, right? Uh, or to align with the marketing campaign, right? To have that button there, it's really easy to do here. Um, I can actually trigger one of them. So, boom, which one is the last one? Hmm. Yeah, you see there's a naming strategy here. Um, boom, boom. Okay, take this one. So it's now just deploying this version on dev. And then once it's done, as you can see, it's doing all kind of stuff. Um, like all this stuff here, like determining the source server group, the health providers, creating the server group itself in Kubernetes in this case, monitoring the deploy, force, forcing the cache refresh. I mean, all this stuff, if you have to do that manually, you're gonna have to write a lot of Ansible, I suppose. Um, so, uh, or Chef or Puppet or whatever. So I suppose this is um, easier for, for starters, for beginners. Although you could argue that Spendicker is maybe even doing too much for most, ca for most um, uh, projects or most companies. But uh, in my experience, uh, it's pretty easy to use as well, so why not? Okay, so once it's then deployed, uh, it can figure out, for instance here, um, what's running on, um, on the dev environment. Um, so that's also logic that you don't have to write yourself and then deploy that in this case with the red black. Okay? Um, there's also an interesting feature here where you can have your deployment window set um, based on, uh, for instance, uh, when, when you're in the office. Okay, so it will wait until you're in the office. And what Netflix does, it's, um, it's aligning that with, um, with the traffic that the, the service is, um, is receiving. So it can actually um, deduct information, like if there's a peak in traffic um, at noon, you could actually deploy then between business hours before noon and afternoon, but not during noon. I mean, something like that. And that's pretty straightforward as well to set up. Um, so I think that's my demo, uh, unless this is really quickly done. Um, yeah, it's, it's still waiting for up, I suppose. Well, I could show you how this works, but it's, it's really simple. You have to click a button. Okay, <laughs> I have to think about my time. Uh, uh, okay, so let's continue. Uh, this was my last, last tool, by the way. So um, we talked about, <coughs> about contract and rest docs, uh, how they are combined, a really powerful tool um, to, um, with, with adjacent views to have clean APIs with versioning uh, and to make sure that they're respected and they're, they're um, uh, that there are tests to support this. String Boot Admin and Microsoft Dashboard to visualize it. Um, Prometheus and ELK for having logs and metrics visualized. Um, and then to have Sonar OWASP, of course, for your quality gates. And Wiremock and Saboteur for your, for your virtualization and your tests together with Troublemaker for chaos. Okay, so this gives you more tools that, which all integrate really well with Spring. Um, which complements your entire ecosystem. Okay, and there's, um, if you're working with Cloud Foundry, by the way, um, some of these are already provided in the, in the platform, uh, almost most of them, I suppose. Um, it also works for Spinnaker really well. So if you already got that, that's easy to come out of the box. Um, okay, so those are the tools I was talking about. Now we're entering the danger zone. <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions for me, shoot. If I still have time, at least. Don't want to take up too much time of your enjoying of the beer, I suppose. <laughs> Any questions? Otherwise, you can also reach me on Twitter, um, which is there. Um, or while we're drinking beers, maybe even better. Uh, <laughs> OK, cool. So enjoy the conference. <laughs> <laughs>